Um, thanks. There's Richard. your clicker. Oh, great. Right. Um, now, I actually saw a sneak peek of your slides, fortunately, because I looked at them at not the beginning, though, <laughs> halfway through, not to ruin what I'm going to talk about. Uh, <laughs> that's great, thanks. Um, and I thought, oh, damn, that you've covered all the points that I would normally talk about in a, in a speech, but that's great. It's great to see there's so much similarity. I'm just um, your introduction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. What I'm going to talk about is very similar, some very similar things. What makes a really successful campaign on Change.org? Particularly this idea of what I like to call accidental activism. You said you were an accidental, did you fell into digital accidentally? I fell into activi activism accidentally. You know, I didn't come from a traditional um, activism background. I, um, at school, didn't identify necessarily very politically. I just cared about working on issues that meant a lot to me and that, you know, working to support people on those issues. So for me, I'm doing the perfect job because that's what Change Org Org does. And the internet is a fantastic tool for really inspiring and um, empowering people to create um, people powered change. Just quickly, um, for those of you who haven't heard of us, I hope most people have in the room. Um, Change.org, which is our website, um, we are the world's biggest petition platform and our mission is to empower people to create the change they want to see in the world. So we don't have a policy agenda, we don't, we're not an advocacy organisation. Um, we want to give people the tools, the free tools, to create the change and give them the power that they have, the sort of the organisations have. So the campaigns that really do well on our site often have um, the narrative of David standing up to Goliath, so an individual taking on a real you know, big government or corporation and winning. Um, we have victories every day in the UK, as, said, as you said. Um, we had 14 victories in the UK just using Change.org last week alone. That was sort of our best on record, I think. Um, I started it just over two years ago. We had about 200,000 users, 100,000 users. We've now got nearly 5 million users in the UK in just over two years. So it's been some phenomenal growth. We've got nearly 70 million users worldwide and teams in about 18 countries supporting people running campaigns in those, um, uh, in those countries. So I'm going to talk about the three key aspects of successful campaigns. Stories, timing, and a tangible arc. So, um, Nick, you mentioned a bit about storytelling, and strong personal stories are really at the heart of all of the successful campaigns that we see on, the, on, the, on our site. And they engage a really broad audience, and they create people-powered change. And the internet has given people this platform to share their stories. Previously, they would just have their story, and now the internet has given them that um, platform to share their story and use it to create change in the world. And here's one of those stories. This is Fana Mohammed. She is a 17-year-old British Somali. She's from Bristol. Um, she uh, is very active in her school. She's working with a, a small charity. She's on sort of on their board, and they are teaching about the risks of um, FGM, female genital mutilation. Not the most appealing of topics, but she managed to engage nearly 250,000 people to sign her petition, calling on Michael Gove to send guidance to teachers to teach about the risks of FGM. She got involved in the issue because she heard about her friends who'd been affected by FGM, what it had, you know, meant, for, meant to them and the impact it had on their lives. Um, and she went face to face with Michael Gove and won. Not to be really, but... Um, Here's how it rolled out. So as many of you may have seen on The Guardian, um, it was a Guardian-backed campaign. They were really interested in this issue. Um, there was Integrate Bristol, who are a small charity of working with Pharma. Um, so we had a really small charity on the ground working with those people affected. We had the power of The Guardian, um, <laughs> bringing those two together, plus the 200,000 or 250,000 nearly in the end signatures through Change.org, with the support of Frankie Moon and Malala, meaning that Michael Gove found himself in a bit of an unenviable, unenviable position on the other side of the table to eight British Somali girls calling on him to issue this guidance and pretty much refusing to leave the room until he did so. And it won. It was a success. Um, this is sort of unprecedented. NGOs have been doing some fantastic work on FGM for many years, but really Farmer and her story and her campaign blew <coughs> the issue up in the media and all in the space of three weeks, which last third in February. The really key part to this is about stories, not facts. You know, these, the facts supported this. 24,000 girls are at risk of FGM every year in the UK. But Farmer's story gave that, um, you know, gave it a real a, a face and a story and a, and a much more sort of engagement to, to the issue. You know, people connect better with stories than they do with facts and statistics. We are, after all, emotional human beings. We're not machines. And so our empathy kicks in for people and for their stories rather than the dry facts and figures. So thinking about how can you bring your story and bring your facts and figures to life. 
made it really hard for Gove to say no to this 17-year-old that was offered Hayden something. The other issue, or the thing we need to uh, uh, definitely have, is timing and momentum, as Nick mentioned, urgency. This is the story, uh, or the campaign, just last month um, with Paddy Power launched um, their campaign, on their advertising, for uh, bets on the uh, offering money back if Oscar Pistorius walked away from the murder trial. Um, Jean Hatchett is a domestic uh, abuse, uh, survivor of domestic abuse. She saw this, and she, this was on the Sunday, Sunday, she started the petition. Um, she started it on the Sunday. We spotted it on the Monday. As you can see, 100,000 people <coughs> by the Tuesday had signed the petition. Tom Watson tweeted this before then. On the Tuesday, she wrote a comment piece, and which she, um, which is calling, obviously calling for them to withdraw the ad. And she asked all of those 100,000 people to complain to the Advertising Standards Authority. Paddy Power was forced to go on and defend their, their bets. She had the large organisations like Refuge coming out and supporting the campaign. And then on Wednesday, the news was that the Advertising Standards Authority said it was the most complained about advert on record, 5,200 complaints, and they ordered for the advert to be pulled. There was a fa Facebook and a Twitter action at the same time that Jean arranged and threw the site. Support kept growing, so they, this is sort of different voices, different points of influence on Paddy Power. So although as the ASA had said that they had to pull the ad, you have you know, it being talked about on Channel 4, you have it being written about by other, um, uh, sort of other gambling sites saying you know, it's trivialising um, the death and does the industry no favours. And then by Friday, so from Sunday to Friday, there was a victory, and they said that they had stopped taking bets in the Oscar Pistorius trial. So there's real sense of urgency, all of this in the space of a week. The other thing which I believe those of you who've been to one Comp event have heard my colleagues speak a few times is the idea of the little big thing. This is what we call a tangible ask. And the campaign on women in bank, or to, to keep women on bank banknotes is a perfect example of that. Caroline Criado Perez, who started the campaign, uh, was calling for uh, the Bank of England to keep the last remaining women on the British banknotes and it was an act that she was being removed. Now that's really relating to the bigger, broader issue of um, how women are portrayed in society and, and in the media. You know, banknote is in everyone's pocket. It's probably the biggest circulation that women have in, in society in some ways. But rather than saying we need to make sure women are represented fairly in society, she took this small issue of how women are represented on banknotes and she won. And through that, she also tackled um, around the equality bill, uh, the equality legislation that fed into how the Bank of England decide you know, what, who they're going to represent on these banknotes. So that's a really great example of taking this big issue and breaking it down to much smaller, achievable asks and winning. Now, all of these campaigns, as Nick mentions about the channels, are fueled primarily by email. Email, it's very easy to get sort of attract, attracted by BuzzFeed, by Twitter, by Facebook, but really the biggest driver of all your traffic and all your information, the most valuable source, is email. There are like four, mi four, mil four billion email addresses and email accounts in the world. I think you know, Facebook has 1.3 billion and growing, Twitter has about 500 million. But email is still such a valuable resource, so don't forget to really use it to engage people and to communicate. And that's about it for me. So if you have story, timing, and a tangible ask, you will win. From, so we've got examples here of the banknote campaign. Um, the second photo is of the family of Cherry Grove who were shot during the Brixton riots. Um, calling for legal aid to be represented fairly at the trial. 30 years they've been campaigning, and in the space of two months, and a petition is going forward, they finally got the legal aid to represent themselves. Um, uh, the mother, Stacey Stafford of Aaron, who's pictured there, um, campaigning to uh, pr preserve his reputation. Um, all of these have used sort of their stories to create the change in their world. Thanks. Brilliant. So, I mean, you just don't have trouble kind of getting up in the morning and dragging yourself into work, do you? No kind of <laughs> motivational challenges if that's what you're doing day to day. Um, how, how brilliant as well that not only do you get a sense of urgency, but you get kind of um, sort of career satisfaction on a daily basis as well. I can see, I can see your, co your nameless colleague, whose name we keep forgetting, smiling in the, uh, in the, in the audience, Johnny. He's, the, he's not on Twitter. Jo Johnny Coventry is the, is, is the author of The Little Big Thing and uh, 
he was that uh, he was at the event w which we uh, invented the pirate radio shout out as well so big shout out Johnny Coventry <laughs> um, okay w we've run out of set piece presentations so um, although are we trending I don't know we were trending this time last year like even before this time last year I think no pressure no pressure um, it's also wonderful of you if you can make eye contact with me as well and like maybe raise your take just take one hand off your smartphone you don't have to take two but just put one in the air um, if you want to get involved yeah I, I'm, I'm gonna go here first and then Sophie just on the basis that you've had a go already <laughs> so uh, chat with the tie thank you for wearing a tie to a WontCom's event and raising the tone <laughs>